This is a video discussing the gravity flyer build. Yeah, I got a couple questions for you on that uh, center plate. I keep seeing it in half. Is there a second half that you have for that, Charlie? Half? No. Here's the original one that you see uh, with the you know, corrosion on it. But that's really like an epoxy or something that was on it while he was uh, got it from the scrapyard or something. A lot of people misinterpret that as uh, the corrosion of the metal, but that's another chemical on there. And that, you know, it's aluminum, so there's a little bit of oxidization on there. So some of the, you know, the uh, coating on it has worn off. It was originally not um, properly, you know, laminated like normal uh, anodized aluminum coating is. And that's pretty normal, like one millimeter. So there, it looks like there's a, a lip, but really that's just the lip of a, a little lid. So it's not, not that thick, it's about one millimeter thick. And has that the lit the bend creates a lip. We only see it from the top view when right now it's upside down. So you can't really tell. And then when he shipped it, he had to bend it. So there's a bend in it. That's why I replaced it because I was worried it might affect you know, how close the discs are and the field. So I had to replace that. Hmm. So there's no second plate on that, huh? Just single plate. Yep, just single plate. That's interesting. Hmm. Makes it a lot little. easier to build. Yeah, and I asked him, and I've tested it since I received it. But he, he confirmed it's just aluminum, and all at three. So I'm using this type of aluminum plate that doesn't have a lip. I found on Amazon. Yeah, I, in, a, in the share drive, I have the build of materials that has this. It's like a cookie cover. Gotcha. And then he just used regular fan motors, right? Like a 12 volt, maybe a uh, what, like an 80 millimeter fan or something. Yes. I've got some of the exact ones he ordered, others I've you know, tried to, they are like 24 volts so I can get higher RPMs. It, yeah, it's basically just a fan motor that you cut off the fan and he kept the, the frame for most of his designs, like in this one. I'm repairing the fan on it now, but uh, it seems he doesn't worry too much about the weight. This one had flown in one of the, the videos. And there you go. So these are just normal, like, 12-volt PC fan motors. I've got one I took out because it overheated and uh, needs to be replaced, so I ordered those. But I've got the exact part number and everything. If you want to order them, you can find them on Amazon as well. Either. So it is 12 volts, 3.1 watt, sun, sun on. Well, it doesn't have to be very powerful, does it? It's just uh, spinning a couple of uh, plates, right? Right. It's it just... on the bottom. There's a lens wall from the magnets, you know, they're a little harder to spin. So it's, uh, you got to slowly ramp it up with a PWM driver. Gotcha. It's also worth mentioning that uh, the fan motors that Alexi uses, um, he, in some of, so starting in like December, November, December, we started getting to have meetings with him, which was awesome. Um, cool. And uh, so, so far we've gotten to see him actually, the, in one meeting, he got it to do the tip over thing that he had it do in his garage. And then the next meeting, he got it to actually lift up off the ground. And then after that meeting, he sent us a phone video, which was much higher resolution, um, where it lifted off the ground again. But something that's worth mentioning is that these fan motors, he's only using uh, 12 volts at half an amp for both motors together, right? So very low power. and with the kits that he sent out we've measured the rpms of those things and they don't go very fast his original numbers of like 2000 2500 or 2500 and 3000 completely wrong um 900 to maybe 1500 1600 is a lot closer to the ballpark additionally, that's what i saw additionally let me uh see if i can share a link with you one moment um I am, I am looking for the link to that outdoor video that he just sent us to. Um, I have that one, Charlie. Yeah, that's the one I use. I have enough amperage that's safely to control it. He's used a smaller one than his kits. Like the little ones you can get on Amazon like this size. But these sometimes overheat and don't work well. So I prefer the larger one. That's what I use for the motors and uh, the high voltage DC as well. So he slowly ramps up the high voltage DC. Uh, he doesn't turn it on full blast right away. 
which a lot of people don't know about, because uh, those are the tuning instructions that he hasn't really gone public yet on it. But he, when he showed us how to do it, the tuning in person, that's what we learned. So it took about 15 to 20 minutes for him to slowly increase the high voltage DC. And he said that's necessary. And you don't want sparking. So I think you know you want that sweet spot where there's like the, the ion wind, but no sparking. Yeah, well, he, from what I saw from the pictures you sent me, it looks more like a static volt than it does a uh, like a high voltage volt, in that it doesn't have a, a lot of amps in it. I saw the power pack. What is it? Uh, Twelve volts, a thousand milliamps, not two point something in amps. Is that correct? Yeah, when you're running at full power to the high voltage DC uh, circuit, you could draw maybe like one amp, uh, at two two amps the most, but then. Uh, you know, it's dissipated between the two discs, and like you, you mentioned, uh, if you have too much high voltage, uh, the, the magnets will de demagnetize. So it's really the current, the current uh, that you want to limit. So you prevent that. Okay. Also, yeah, I was. Go ahead. Also worth mentioning that um, for the high voltage, uh, in one of his recent things where he says um, you got to slowly increase the the high voltage. Um, he goes up until he gets to 16 volts in on that high voltage thing. He's not using these ZVS circuit boards like we're all using. He's using his own home built things. Um, but still, I think it gets us in the ballpark of identifying uh, what high voltage he's getting to. Additionally, Charles has recently noted that on his uh, high voltage kit that he sent Charles, uh, the terminals are so close that it arcs at about 6 kV. Um, so, the the high voltage thing it needs the high voltage but as far as how much high voltage it's not like 30 kv we don't think right and, and it might be 20 kv i've noted on this that when you do the slow increase of about a volt in per minute or one and a half kv per minute um that you can get the voltages the static charge on the discs you can get the bottom disc up to a way higher static charge uh, than you otherwise would if you just turn it on and you know leave it on max and just let it sit there. Additionally, uh, the speed of the top rotor will start going down as the high voltage increases, and I think that's electrostatic drag between them. Let me uh, play this outdoor video that's pretty short that Alexi recently shared with us. Um, see if I can full screen this. So in this video, mute it. Um, the bottom disc, you can see the magnet spinning around on it, and as soon as it takes up off the ground, you're going to see it start to match the frame rate of the camera, which is 30 frames per second. So it's uh, going slow. It looks like it's going slow because it's it's that strobe effect, so it, it's matching okay. the frame rate, right? And that gives us a ballpark of how fast it's going, because see it stops it looks like it stops and now it starts spinning back the other way so what yeah. that means is that it's spinning um oh I, i'm gonna have to go look at my numbers on this but it's like spinning at a certain speed or just below the speed of the frame rate is that right it, it's spinning it, it either speeds up or it slows down i'm gonna have to go look at it again i think it slows down yeah it slows down because it looks like it's starting to go clockwise now but we know it's going counterclockwise so that's probably an important thing to consider is that when this thing lifts up off the ground some extra drag or some energy transfer is going on with this lower disc um see now it looks like it stopped and now it's going back over so that means that it's speeding back up because it's going counterclockwise again I want to say that was 1200 RPM. No, 900 RPM. So uh, if it was 30 frames per second, um, it would be going either 900 or 1800 RPM. And gotcha. since, since we know that 1800 is pretty darn difficult to get to with these things, um, I would lean more towards 900. 900 yeah. Also, as you've seen, when you start spinning these discs up, um, let's see if I can stop sharing now. Uh, as you start spinning these discs up, everything wants to vibrate like crazy, right? But in yeah. all of his videos, we don't really see any vibration. It's because he's spinning them slow. 
Gotcha. Yeah, I agree. I, I figured it was something like that. We were running it way too fast and way too much voltage for me anyway. Uh, I, I noticed, I don't know if you saw my paper lifter experiment. I actually used uh, the flyback with the ZVS to get that lift instead of using my Wilmhurst. So it's got the same thing. It's got that static volt in it. That's why I was asking about how much you put into it because you really, you get the charge with the static. You go too far and you get plasma when you start putting a little more amps into it. So I didn't see anything on his videos where it sparked out. So he had to have static in it. The only sparks I've seen in his stuff are uh, two times. Uh, one time in the garage video where it tips over, you can see on the legs, uh, there's sparking arcs, which means that those, those vertical strut legs there are grounded to the floor. And when it tips over, right, it's breaking that ground on those legs and it shorts out so you get that little arc there. The other time is you can see a little bit of arcing between the disc and the uh, vertical strut there, right? So I've noticed that when you apply the RF, it significantly increases the strength of the eddy current and it significantly increases the strength of the static charges present. Gotcha. So it looked like his top disc was lower to the center plate than his uh, bottom disc did. So is he probably what, like three quarters of an inch off the top? And then like maybe an inch and a half off the bottom? He goes millimeters. And in millimeters, uh, it's usually like 20-ish millimeters top, 30-ish millimeters bottom. But he, he changes this stuff, right? So we've seen 18 and 28. We've seen um, like 22 and 31. And we've seen, um, what was the recent one? 21 and like 38. So, so he's basing it off uh, what you're getting in the atmosphere then. Whatever said, the conditions are. He says that you set those based upon the ultrasound. That's how you figure out the distances is based on the ultrasound. And he also says that those distances change with uh, ambient temperature. So in colder conditions, yeah. it's got to be closer. In hotter conditions, it's got to be farther. Let me share one other thing I have with you here. Oh, shoot. <laughs> so it gets you the static volt with just that inside of what you're doing so if you can put sand in water in a little bottle you can run the tubes in there run them out and it'll give you the static volts instead of running wires themselves so just so you have a little background on the ambient part so now I can yeah, all we know he uses is a, a ZBS or a, a flyback. He built his own kind of ZBS circuit. It's in the uh, schematics. You can see in the pictures of the, the kits. So on this spreadsheet that I've made, um, similar to what you made recently where you're like, look at these frequencies that are like the harmonic notes and stuff. So I've gone through and I've done calculations for the skin depth as well as like, you know, half a wavelength or a double wavelength for that, as well as for the speed of sound in aluminum, as well as the speed of sound in air. Um, and from this, all these ones in green or yellow are ones that fall within the number ranges for what Alexi has given us. So okay. you have the diameter of a, a rotor, a spinning disc, which is eight inches or 202 millimeters, right? So give or take like 20 millimeters on that. Um, you have the spacings, right? Which are here in yellow as well as green. Um, yellow are from the more recent spacings numbers that they gave us. Uh, green are from the older spacing numbers. Um, and then you have the bright green, which is like thickness, right? So the thickness of the discs is one millimeters. So from this, what I do is I go, okay, this one's got a lot of highlighted stuff in it. That's probably an important frequency over here that you need to look at, right? So 28 kilohertz. Well, I've noted uh, at the beginning of all this that the, uh, the discs, I put a piezo on top in the center and a piezo on bottom in the center on just a, a disc by itself and I you know I sweep through all the frequencies to see where does it vibrate the most where do I get the most return on that vibration 
and like 27 kilohertz was one of the big ones. And during testing, I've seen also around 27, but I've also noted down at 20. Alexi in his most recent um, lifting off video, we got him a, a little multimeter that has a frequency function on it. We're like, hey, we need the ultrasound frequency. If you get us the ultrasound frequency, like everything else falls into place. And the dude can't use a multimeter. <laughs> That's he can funny. build an anti-gravity machine, but he can't use can't a multimeter. Use a multimeter. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, he so, probably just does it by touch, man. He probably doesn't need any of that. Touch and sound and intuition. and But he he may have successfully measured it and the number that he thinks he measured was about 92 kilohertz which is way higher for the ultrasound than we ever thought right we thought it was like 20 maybe 30 possibly 40 since that's like the frequency of the zvs right the high voltage is around 40 so maybe it's up there no 90 kilohertz well that makes more sense because it has to have a punch it, <clears throat> the amplitude of ultrasound goes down exponentially in air, right? So as you go up in frequency, the amount of like punch that that speaker has just gets totally dampened by the air. So it's got to be going through the material, right? It's got to be vibrating yeah. everything like that. Well, there's one other thing to consider is that that little piezoelectric buzzer is like a little capacitor that's going wah, 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 right? So it has voltages and charges on it that are moving around. If you are moving those in some interval or integer of the other vibrations going on here, there, there might be some important things there, especially because that's the very last step that he does is he turns off, once he gets everything tuned up, he turns off the ultrasound for just a second or two and then lets it turn back on. And he'll do that a couple of times and it's like he's trying to get get stuff in phase. And I've noted that when you turn it off, you get like an EMP. You get you get this burst out of energy, and it's fried my hard drive. It's done all sorts of crap to me. Um, but the fact that five volts <laughs> to a piezoelectric buzzer is enough to cause all these fields to go right? That that tells you that that little piezo buzzer is doing a lot more than just you know vibrating or not vibrating things well I, I looked at it as a dump circuit so basically it builds up builds up on the piezo disc and then it goes into the ultrasound thing uh and then it dumps out is that right or you guys have something different on that he he says that the way that he finds the right ultrasound frequency and we watched him do this. He takes his Tesla coil and he's ramping his Tesla coil up and down, right? In amplitude, because he's just got that one potentiometer. He's ramping up and down. And then with the other hand, he's slowly increasing the frequency of the ultrasound. And he does that until he starts getting the special sound from the Tesla coil. I've noticed that the ultrasound frequency changes the vibration of the discs, right? So okay. the discs when they are out of sync kind of that eddy current creates like a grinding on them and so you get this brum, brum, right well you can control the rate of that brum, by affecting the frequency of the ultrasound so either it's affecting the eddy current or it's affecting the charges on the discs something along those lines but it's it's once he finds whatever ultrasound frequency causes the tesla coil to ring now this is important if the tesla coil is ringing with an audible sound, that means that you got a back EMF going up into that thing that is causing it to resonate at some way low frequency, because this thing's operating at a megahertz, right? The, the secondary is operating at a megahertz. Um, this thing is supposed to be going at the same, but it it's really probably more like 250 to 350 kilohertz is the fundamental, and the 1.2 megahertz is like a higher harmonic. So if this thing's operating at like 270 kilohertz, then that means the 90 kilohertz was the one third of that. So it's possible that the ultrasound is actually helping that back EMF get kind of like amplified until the Tesla coil is like starting to ring. My, my current guess on this as of like yesterday 
is that your power factor, your 90 degree phase angle between your voltage and your current, as you start lowering that and bringing the, the two waves more and more in sync, you lower your, your quality of your power, right? You get much um, dirtier electricity. Um, and eventually, once you bring them completely in phase, now you're not really getting any meaningful use out of that electricity. It's all wasted. But if you bring it back and then you go back below zero degrees, and so now it's, you know, current is lagging voltage. Now, instead of this thing putting out energy, you're forcing energy back into it. If you have a reverse, a reversal of the direction of energy flow, that might help explain how this thing is taking off the ground because it's all about the direction of the energy flow. They call it the pointing vector. So if, if your energy is flowing in one direction, your thing should be going in that direction. If your energy is going back the other way, then it should be going back the other way. So if this thing's normally going down because of gravity and you're forcing enough energy back into this that you're now counteracting that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know the physics of why it works, but uh, you could tell John Hutchison recommended this actually to, uh, to me. Use a uh, AM radio. Here I've got a little one in the parts list that's in the share drive. That you could use and by that you could pick up the, the waves coming off the gravel flyer and as you turn the high voltage dc on you hear it change when you switch the high voltage dc on it switches and then when you are adjusting the ultrasound you'd also hear changes in, in the fields um, from the radio so i could sh i'll probably make a video of that soon to to show you what it sounds like what to look for but then there's a special sound where you probably have to listen for i haven't figured it out yet but then when you get to that sound you'll pull the ultrasound and that's when it lifts up so I'm still trying to figure that part out, but the rest, I think, uh, I understand. There, well, I know there's when, a connection with the ultrasound and the high voltage. That's right. I know when you have two frequencies, if you get them close to each other but not exactly uh, right on, you actually get beeps. And I sent you a video on that. It, it, it'll make a boom, 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 and it'll start doing that. To me, I, I work kind of like Alexi. I just listen for it, and that's what I'm looking for right there. When they're really close to each other, I know the speeds are a little off from each other. And so say for instance, uh, just arbitrary number, say if the center plate was set at 50, right? Then the top one would be at 51 and maybe the bottom at 52. And those ranges right there, you'd get the beeps right there. So I don't know if that makes any sense to you guys, but uh, it's just a little bit off on both discs because one's obviously gonna be a little slower than the other. So you get a little bit off but I think the whole thing gets resonated in that ele that static field is what really drives it from there. Have you managed to get stuff set up, you know, distances and speeds yet where you get the discs to actually like vibrate enough that you get like a, a musical note off of it? Uh, I've gotten it. Uh, let me say it this way. You, you ever run your 3D printer and it makes you do a circle. Okay, just like a six inch disc circle. And you hear it go doo -doo -doo just like that yep. that's the exact sound that i get that's so, when my I, you can know when they're harmonized so uh i've noticed that in in like music right you got a chord right a one three five and a chord well i've gotten it so that it'll either make the 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 one just the straight one that's when it's like the most perfectly tuned when it's slightly detuned you'll get it jumping between one and three or one and five and when it's even a little more detuned, it'll jump between all three. Uh, some of my math shows that if you could get the seventh, so one, three, five, and then a seventh note, if you can get that seventh, that's where you get the maximum power transfer. Okay. So I don't know how to get that though. I've never gotten the seventh note. I've only gotten the three notes before. And that's just a mathematics thing. So it, it's not, you know, it's not what I'm actually seeing with this thing. What I'm seeing with this thing is that when you get it in that fundamental just um, that's where it seems like you get uh, the cleanest signal. Additionally, on the spectrum analyzer, which I highly recommend having some kind of spectrum, you can even use a nano VNA, um, which is pretty cheap, but the beat frequency of the disks changes uh, your RF profile so when the top disc is going faster than the bottom disc you get this down frequency chirp so it starts up at like 150 meg and it drops all the way down and goes down to zero right and as it gets down towards zero it starts going up in amplitude 
if the top disc is going slightly slower, that uh, chirp goes up in frequency. Well, since Alexi has always told us that the top disc should be spinning faster than the bottom disc, which makes sense because he's feeding half or a quarter amp at 12 volt to each of them, and the bottom one's got a bunch of magnets on it, so the top one should be going faster. Um, that means that that RF chirp should be going down in frequency, you know, um, which if, if that's the case, then that might make sense how you're getting this Tesla coil to, to make the noise is because if that thing is pushing it down towards the, you know, 90 kilohertz or 350 kilohertz or, you know, that range of the Tesla coil that pushes it down there, it's forcing energy back up into the Tesla coil. Hmm. I got a question. How do you guys not blow your Tesla coil? I've blown three of them. <laughs> that was why. I, that was why I reached out to you. Was because in your most recent one, you're like Slayer Exciter's stupid. I'm like I've been screaming for the last two weeks how much I hate the Slayer circuit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I used a fifty dollar driver man from China, and I still, because of the size of the gravity flyer itself, it puts so much back pressure on it. It blows those things quick. Yep, I won with it caught on fire because especially with the Alexi circuit, the uh, potentiometer doesn't have like a protection resistor. So if you go all the way one side on the potentiometer, then it's full current to the transistor and it'll burn everything in, in the circuit. So I've done that a few times, but you got to be really careful, uh, especially with, with this circuit. But he doesn't have it directly in contact with the output of the, the secondary coil. He just has it down the center and it's picking up the high voltage charge through that uh, for indoor testing. He said when he goes outdoor and he has a longer wire, and he'll connect it to the output of the secondary, and then you got to be more careful with so overheating he, it. So hold on, it's not anywhere close to that secondary coil? It's not attached to it? Not physically attached in yeah, indoor uh, testing. Yeah, it's just a, a wire that goes down the center. So he's getting the light show. When you put it in the center, you get a light show where all the sparks go to the wire. Right, it'll pick up the high voltage, and you'll see it sparking a little bit on the on the wire. If you use a thinner wire without insulation, uh, you'll be better so he, off early videos he just used a copper enamel you wider he's, wire he, he's getting a static bolt out of it right. so it's yeah. it's not a regular volt that you would get out of it if you attach something like a big spark line that you would get from your testicle he's getting a static bolt so it's basically the it jumping through the air to get to that wire capacitively coupled is what you call it and we've asked him because you what you'll notice is when you put the wire down the throat of the thing as you go deeper and deeper down the throat, it's going to lower the frequency of the Tesla coil. Uh, so since he's putting it, you know, all the way down the throat, he's slightly lowering the frequency of the Tesla coil when he goes outdoors or when he does indoor testing. When he does outdoor testing, it's slightly higher in frequency because it's directly, you know, connected. Additionally, you can still get that really high voltage if it's down the throat. The difference between down the throat and direct connection is that you get a little bit more current. It's less just electrostatic, you know, and electromagnetic because it's, you know, got a distance there away from all the coils. But when it's directly connected to the coil, um, that current transfer goes way up. So he, there's no mathematical way to build the Tesla coil to match the frequency of the disk. It's all by tuning then. You're not, because you're changing where the wire goes, you're not having a set figure on your Tesla coil. That might be part of the reason why it's different tuning every time. That and, you know, ambient conditions and all that. Um, the, the frequency of the Tesla coil also can't be set because the ionosphere affects your local charge, right? And that was something that Alexi mentioned to me in an email like a year ago was uh, the frequency is different at any given moment and it's different at different times of the year because of the ionosphere. So I had to look into that, I had to test that. And after I did a bunch of testing with that, I did like morning tests and afternoon tests and evening tests. And I, sure enough, I noticed that um, when your peak sunlight, right? And the ionosphere is like pushed in close to the earth. Um, that's when you can use those um, lower frequencies but when it's, it's less charged and it's farther away, that's when you have to use these higher frequencies. Um, but the weird thing is, uh, the lowest frequency that you're reliably going to be getting from the ionosphere is like 3 meg. 
it, it might go down to 2.5 and then like in the most energetic conditions it'll be like 1.8 so his 1.2 is not the number it's got to be a higher harmonic of that 2.4 3.8 something like that right which with the slayer xire circuit you get you know 390 1.2 2.4 3.8 right so at the frequency where you actually need to be putting it in that's where it's got like the least amount of juice got it also i tried i tried doing a spark gap um because you you said you know we need to be doing a spark gap on this it's like yeah we do so i tried doing a spark gap the last couple days and sparks are not great if you got a lot of electronics around <laughs> they make all your electronics go ah you know with every single spark so i'm watching all of my stuff just like beep and blink off and well hold on hold on your your coil isn't set high enough where it's past the 50 hertz of your TV? Uh, the the flyback? Because mine doesn't... I can put it right in front of my TV and it doesn't affect it. It, it depends how fast you're running at your, when you're ZVS. Yeah, so that was one of your designs that I really liked was the adjustable PWM for the, the ZVS. Like, that was, that was gold. Um, I haven't built that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been doing the, the regular ZVS and turn up or turn down the power and, you know, it goes from like 39 and a half down to like 38 and a half kilohertz as you go up in power. Well, the whole reason I built that circuit is I, I wanted to remove the Tesla coil and put in a circuit on the gravity flyer that I can adjust right there. So, you know what I mean? I can condense some of this stuff all together, get rid of the wires. So nobody online tells me that there's something hanging on there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I don't like this. Oh, it looks, it looks like a post when it's a wire. I I want it to be separate. So that's why I built that circuit. I wanted to, but if it's changing all the time, I mean, that'd be just awful. That's what's good about the Slayer Exciter circuit. It'll self-adjust. So when you start you know, adjusting the capacitance with the wire down it, it'll uh, adjust for that by itself. You don't have to manually do it. No, I got to stick with that. So I, you know what? I just got to find a better MOSFET. Like a TV MOSFET for a tube TV, much better than a, what is it, something 44, I think it was. That thing is junk. It never should have been built. But the other ones are like 5 volts for the uh, trigger or whatever it is. That's has 5 volts into it. And you can use the TV one that came with, uh, well, if you tore it out of a TV, it came in there. They, they go 300 volts, so you're not blowing it up. You can also use a diode right you use like a, a a short diode in reverse configuration and that way um if the voltage gets above five volts it just bleeds all that you know down into ground and anything below five volts goes to the trigger i've done that before and that's extended the lifespan of it but it still doesn't like permanently fix the crappy contraption that is the slayer exciter but like charles said the slayer exciter is like it's amazing for one thing and that's the self resonant it's a feedback right well i found on aliexpress you can get a bunch of different tesla coil driver stuff out there and they got dual resonant ones out there which is way better than slayer etc because that's just you know it's pulsing it for like every positive cycle or something right so you're only getting half the number of like triggering that you could be getting so for these dr dual resonant ones um they have feedback in there, so you can put the secondary back in there. But even better feedback mechanism is they have a current sensor that you just put near the, the primary. And that current sensor from the primary is what is your your synchro. Um, yeah, that's like the one I have. I got a Chinese driver that does that. It's got four MOSFETs on it. I got to put a fan on it. But I can run uh, 300 volts DC into it and get a spark maybe that long. So it'll work for that. I didn't know if it would work for this because it's just too high a volt. So I can always turn it down. Uh, and then- Do you have any idea what the frequency of it is? Uh, no, I, you know, I got the uh, oscilloscope. I'm not a big oscilloscope guy. I have to sit down and really take the time to do it. It's just been hard, kids, stuff like that. My kids are having kids, so. I got a big family going on, so I'm just trying to make the time to do it and, and learn it. But once I do, I'll be where you guys are at. 
Somet- sometimes oscilloscopes have a, a measure button of some kind, and yeah. you can just push that, and it'll automatically tell you what the frequency is for anything. It makes it a lot easier than counting the Oh, just, just like the other video I sent you to with the speaker, because I wanted to know the resonance value of the actual plate. You know what I mean? Because if you find that, then I, I'm sure we can put everything right around that value, you know, a little bit up on the top disc, a little bit down on the bottom disc, and I bet you can match that coil to it. Instead of playing in the dark, we could play in the light. You know what I mean? And have the right frequencies to it. Because once that thing resonates, I'm, I'm telling you, we're going to hit it. Let me see if I can find this. I did some tests a couple weeks ago where I took the um, spinning discs and I, like, did, you know, both close together, one far, the other far, and then both far apart. And I was doing RF sweeps on them to see, like, how does that RF profile change with the distances? Because that might help you identify what proper distance is, right? Um, Let me see if I can find a picture of that. I can share it with y'all. Rotor sweeps. You mentioned you're trying to find different MOSFETs and NVAN transistors for the Tesla coil. So Alexi's had several different design changes on that. And uh, in the share drive, in the gravel flyer kits, the kits two and three are probably the best. And I think in two, he uses a MOSFET. And in three, it's a higher power NPM transistor. Yeah, I saw that. I looked that up. Uh, what was it? Uh, 577 or 522, something like that. And it had a six volt trigger. See, I got it here. Just yeah, the C two five seven seven. That's what I'm using mostly. Yeah, it works really well. That looks like a TV one. To be very honest with you, I ripped those out of a bunch of you know, tube TVs. That's what it looks like. Yeah, that's probably where he got it. He got a lot of it from a junkyard, so he's repurposed a lot. So it probably explains why we're popping those things all the time, and he's not because they're used to driving a flyback. So you're going to get a lot more voltage out of them. So that would probably be better for all of us to switch something like that and get the right one. Because that D44 is just awful. Yeah, I tried the original one was a KT819, and that's a real old, like, Russian. That's hard to find. They had discontinued, and that one burns up real easy. So No, it's Toshiba one's better. I used one of those before. It lasted a long time, a long, long time. So, and I... I used it on a very short coil, something like this size. And I just wanted to get the frequency a lot lower. You know what I mean? I didn't want, you know, big, tall ones, stuff like that. I wanted that frequency a lot lower. So it worked out perfect. It doesn't have a huge distance to it, but it does stay resonating well. So in these sweeps that I did, um, this I don't think demonstrates it nearly as well as... Is this from the video I saw the other day? Uh, no, this was, um, this was a bunch of sweeps I, I did, uh, that I didn't really make any videos about, but let me see, here we go. So I overlaid them all, and then I colored in all the spots where all the sweeps seem to overlap, right? So I was looking for what frequency seems to show up, you know, over and over, or change the most when you move the rotors close together or far apart. And what I noticed was somewhere down in the 7 megahertz range, and then up around the 20 to 30 megahertz range, 28 megahertz. Those seemed to be spots where it had the greatest variation. Um, And then one interesting spot to notice is this huge dip here, which happens around 11 to 13 megahertz. So with a lot of the RF stuff that I've done, it seems like the Graviflyer performs the best somewhere between 11 to 14 megahertz and stop sharing now um i got this ham radio set up here right and so for a while i tried using that instead of the tesla coil and that was how i ended up testing the ionosphere stuff was using the ham radio because i can just sweep through all the frequencies right um you know and i key it and i see how much does the speed of the discs change because the speed of the disks is strongly determined by the charges on the disks, right? As you put on the high voltage, the disks slow down. 
um, and as you key the mic or as you turn on the RF, that increases the voltage and so it slows them down more uh, or it disperses the charge and it speeds them up either way. So I, I went through and I tested them all and 14 megahertz was where I got like the best responses. Um, additionally, uh, there's these things called LAM waves, which are uh, basically just waves in any medium, like a metal, right? And especially in thin, big, thin pieces of metal, there's a lot of good research out there on these things called LAM waves and stuff exactly like this. Let me see if I can find a picture of what those look like, because they're pretty cool. Um, Have you guys tried any tuning forks or anything when you run your, your stuff? Not one, John. wanted us to ask you about that. Uh, what do you recommend? How do we use it? Got some here. Okay. Well, seen this kit on Amazon. They're different frequencies, sizes. So I was trying for a different experiment, but I can try to use it with the grab applier. You want me to just hit the plates with each one, see what sound resonates? Well, what I found is it's in, what is it, A uh, with the uh, number sign? And you can hear the value a lot better from the okay. disc. Oh, okay. All right. The other ones you don't get a whole lot of uh, sound coming from it when you when you put it on there and hold it on there, which mm -hmm. means it's not even the right frequency. No, oh, so you put it on there when they're on when it's charged. Yeah, like you, you you tap it and then you sat it on there. You should get a sound from it, and if it's a very low sound, it's not the right frequency. So the singing notes that I mentioned that I'd heard, um, yeah, the 135 there, it's like at 400 hertz and 600 hertz and 700 hertz, um, which using that tuning fork, it's kind of like you're, you're, you know, making the thing sing on its own, you know, you're hitting the tuning fork and then putting it on the disc. Um, it's like the same thing as the disc spinning so fast that the edges are like vibrating at that. Yeah, Charlie, you got to like strike it on the table and then set the uh, bottom of it right on top of the plate. Okay. If there's no sound on it, it's the wrong one. Which one do you have? Uh, the A? Sharp, yeah. 426.6. 6. Um, I hear it, but I guess it doesn't it doesn't pick up on the the video because it has noise canceling. Gotcha. If I do recording, you might be able to hear it. So I can show you that. What I found is you get a sound out of it, and it's not 100% the right sound. It's a little off. Like, mm -hmm. hold on this. When you put in B or something like that, it'll go uh, way too low on the sound, where you don't hardly hear it at all. It's just like basically striking it once, and you get no vibration. Mm -hmm. Then when you put on the A, and you tap it, and you put it on there, it starts to really vibrate out through the disc. And that's when you get a heavier sound. That's what I'm hearing when I do it. I, I'm trying to find the right frequency for the center disc, guys, just so you know. And I want to set my top and bottom plate just above and just below that frequency. So that it has a little bit of range in there because I want to hear the beep sound when I'm actually doing it. So if I have the resonant value of the plate, I'm set. That means I can take the two boxes with the tuning forks on them, put the correct tuning forks in there, and then I can get the center plate to on its own resonate between the two boxes. Does that make a lot of sense to you guys at all? <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's kind of a different way than you guys approach it, but it, it, it sets a resonance value to me. Because if that's the resonance value of aluminum, the whole craft is aluminum except for the all threads that you guys put into it. So that means the whole craft will resonate plates and all right around that frequency. The legs are too are like a stainless steel. Uh, metal. So I've tried to use aluminum, but the, the threading always gets stripped or bent or something. It's difficult to assemble and uh, adjust. That's why I use the bars instead. Okay. Yeah. Was, I also prefer to use like stainless steel, which might affect the fields because it's connected to the center plate through the uh, nut and the, the washer. So we're worried that the fields need that steel <laughs> to uh, affect the AC. Well, oh, I'm not sure. I could tell you this it's all one. Uh, I don't care where I touch that gravity flyer. I'm getting shocked if there's high voltage in it. So 
it, it makes one circuit no matter what metal you try. Yeah. So that's why I just went with the bars. It was so much simpler just to put something over it where I can guarantee the exact height and everything else. Except, it, you know, less weight. Uh, what do you guys think about the weight? Yeah, I tried to reduce it. In one of the videos, he said, uh, I think he's tried to make it lighter as well, but he's noticed that it works kind of better with the more mass. I think John Hutchison's something similar, that uh, his equipment has to be several tons in order to get the effect. Whenever people try to replicate it with other high voltage equipment that's lighter, they don't get to see the same results. So something in the mass and uh, the high voltage affects it. I'm not sure how. Gotcha. But yeah, we tried to make modifications and every time we adjust to Alice's design, uh, we find out that it wasn't a good move. <laughs> we should have just stuck with the original. So yeah, we've been trying to go back to the original design as much as possible, at least till we get the first lift. Then we can start adjusting other things. But I've been testing with his kit. Uh, yeah, but I have to replace the bottom motor to do more testing with it. The rest are pretty good. I mean, yeah, we could improve the circuit by using a ZVS instead of the high power uh, resistors and transistor he has in his designs, but then uh, there's less current going to the ZVS, and then the, the plates uh, might affect you know, the, the result. So we're not sure if uh, that's a good move or not. Well, the from what I found, there's plenty of power going to that ZVS. You're not lacking anything there. It all depends on what power you're putting into it. Generally at 12 volts, and uh, what is it, two amps putting into there? <laughs> uh, just on a little DC power pack, you're actually over volting probably what he has. So that's why I was interested in the power pack that I saw in your pictures. It showed a thousand milliamps, more like a uh, uh, inkjet printer, is what the voltage is. It was uh, what was it, twelve volts, thousand milliamps? That would change the entire thing. Does that make sense to you? Because when I do high voltage experiments, when I run them off of each other, it's got to be about two and a quarter inches right there, and then you get the plasma. And you know, depending on what time of the morning I do it at it could vary just a hair. So, and that's over the voltage of what it sounds like he's gotten there. Because it sounds like he's pulling just a straight static volt. If you got a thousand milliamps versus two amps, you don't have anything but static. You don't, you don't have plasma at all. It won't form. Yeah. So, it just sounds like he's charging the plates with static. Is that where you guys are at with it? Yes, they were. Yeah, I don't think it's too high because he puts them pretty close. And if it was high voltage, you would start to see sparking, which he says you don't want. And he it's says just, that they don't touch the plate at all, right? They sit off of it? Right. Well, the uh, the brushes oh, that are scraping on it, though, there's a uh, brass brush that makes contact uh, with the plate like this. Here you could see that's my design. Uh, this was Alex's design. And you, you hear it scraping in the videos, so he has a high voltage plate going to brass brush that connects directly to it. You better hear. Which is worth mentioning that uh, as those plates, you know, are vibrating, as those discs are vibrating, um, that brush has a little spring value to it, right? And so it kind of bounces a bit. So that's why I think that the frequency of the high voltage isn't really important. It's more the frequent uh, the uh, the, the charge from that because since those things are bouncing right and they're you know off it for however long you know just completely skipping a ton of cycles and then they contact it again um it, it, and they're bouncing like crazy anyways that's that's too noisy of of a thing to to be a thing right yeah well, well you're getting frequency out of the disc anyway i mean once you put the voltage in there you're going to get a frequency it's also worth observing that as those discs are physically vibrating and getting closer and farther away from the center disc or the center disc is vibrating, right? That everything's, you know, oscillating close and far apart. Um, just like parallel plate capacitor, if you took a parallel plate capacitor and you move one plate closer to the other plate, your capacitance uh, changes, right? And as you move it farther away, your capacitance changes. So if it's doing this, you have a constantly changing capacitance and impedance. Um, and those constantly changing things, they're called complex capacitance or complex impedance when they're constantly changing like that. Well, that constant change from the vibrating disks and stuff, my thinking right now is that the sound that you hear from these when they're singing 
it might be a similar uh, frequency of singing that comes from this guy, um, and that that might in some way be related to that complex, you know, constantly changing thing between them all. So that might also relate to the spacing of the discs and why the spaces are important because it might be that as you know it's moving up and down by a plus minus a millimeter or two um that you know both discs need to be moving by a certain amount and the charges on those need to be equal and opposite um so that's why you use the tesla coil that way so that it can uh, fill in the gaps if the center plate's charged with the tesla coil and the two plates are going up and down a little bit it means that it evens it out that, that's what you're looking at right yep okay so you like neon bulbs uh, it uses DC to kind of start the spark and then AC to keep them lit. So there's an interaction even there with DC and AC. But with the gravel flyer, you, as soon as you get the motor spinning, the DC on, and then when you turn on the AC, you should see a spark that changes uh, in, in brightness. And then if you turn off the lights, you'd see it between the other brushes on the top and the bottom. And you know you're getting the effect between the interaction of the DC and the AC. That's one thing. Well, hold on. When you say DC and AC, you're talking about the uh, Tesla coil being the AC. Yes. Okay, and then the uh, okay. I just want to make sure. It, it might also be right. that for the AC, right? When the AC goes into the positive half of the cycle, um, and you got positive charge on the top, right? You've added more positive for that brief amount of time, and so you get sparking. Um, and then same goes for the bottom. Now for the bottom half cycle of that AC, uh, you've added additional negative charge on the bottom, which causes sparking, right? Or maybe it's opposite. Maybe maybe it's that uh, the positive half cycle um, changes. That's it. When you have the positive half cycle of you know a thousand volts AC, and you put that thousand volts AC around this thing down here which is charged super negative well now you have something that is at negative 19 kilovolts or negative 9 kilovolts right but that that brush is a thousand kilovolts more and so now you have a thousand kilovolt arc same goes for the top when when you have the negative half you know negative thousand volts ac from this guy the brush is charged at you know plus 10 kV, but now this this disc is getting that AC component to it, which is taking a thousand volts away from it. So now I've got a thousand volt imbalance there, and so you're getting a spark. So let me ask you this: when they're in phase, okay, let's see if I got the language right, in phase together, the AC and the DC, is that when you're getting your big uh, like EMP thing where? It sucks in a lot and then comes out with a super high voltage on the other side. The, the, the EMP thing, um, you've, you've built up a charge, right? If I turn off right. the high voltage, so there's, there's just all that remains is the static charge on these. And then I do the ultrasound pulse, I'll still get the EMP because what the EMP is doing is it's uh, combining with the RF and those two things together are like either containing or, you know, not containing the static charge, rotating static charge on here. And so when you lose that confinement, that's when you get the, the EMP pulse. So the frequency of the high voltage DC, not all that important. Just the fact that the high voltage DC is present. Okay. I think it's related to this plasma toroid device I've seen on my YouTube channel. I was trying to study it to better understand if there's a toroid forming around the gravel flyer that in nitrogen might not be visible to the naked eye. But in, in this, I'm using xenon gas and uh, it uses, uh, you have to put static on it through like rubbing this glass with a nylon uh, something. So you don't need much static, um, which is probably what gravify is doing. It's just charging a little bit of static on the, the disc. And then the AC is what does most of the work in this circuit. Uh, there's the coils running underneath it, and that AC field is what creates the plasma toroid. And you have to kind of spin it and uh, use your hand as, to adjust the capacitance until eventually the plasma, you know, wraps around itself and it makes the toroid, and then it can become self-stable. And I'm not sure if that could be uh, if there's any weight loss from forming it yet, but I think it's so related to how the gravel flyer lifts up. You don't yeah. need much. You see, you, know, you just need a little bit of static. 
So is that what Alexia is saying this thing runs on? Well, he doesn't know the plasma toroid. He just knows the process of the tuning, and even that was difficult for him to explain. We had to see it in, in person to, or, well, in, in video, a live video to understand the tuning process. Okay, well, what is he saying is the lift factor in this? Like, what, what makes it torsion? <laughs> he has a theory. Oh, I guess any of his videos are translated to English using a new AI, so they're English dubbed now, and you could go through his uh, theory videos, but he's not sure exactly. I think he's re related to thinking more like uh, the charges on the discs are propelling the Earth and attracting you know, the, the sky, and that, that charge is what's make, creating the lift. Okay, so that... He, so I'm trying to put together in my own head exactly what he's trying to say is the part that makes it an anti-gravity device. Like, what, what is he defining additive gravity as? Well, it flies like a UFO. It looks like a UFO, I guess, when it's flying. That's what he colloquially known as anti-gravity. But it might be, uh, you know, magnetohydrodynamic or electrostatic or another uh, propelling up there with some magnetic field. We don't really know yet until we do more studies. Because well, it, it would make sense if he says I'm building a charge and the charge is, is pushing all the other charges away from it so it's isolated by itself and it just acts like a bubble and it floats up in the air. Okay. I, I mean, I can believe that based on what you guys are saying as far as what everything is building as, but I'm not seeing it pulling up or pushing away at, mm -hmm. at all. It just seems like it's charges that, that nullify the gravity effect of pulling down. It's unique that it's not like a lift ion lifter because it's much too heavy for that, and it's not dense, you know, it's not buoyancy like a, a balloon, so it's a different force, so we're not sure why it's lifting up <laughs> something something worth observing is uh when it lifts it looks like it's lifting by a string from the very center right except when it tips over when it tips over that means that it's like that string that's lifting it is off center right and usually that happens because the discs aren't at the right um spacing and they might be just a little bit off center right so in the first zoom call we had with them where he tried to get it to lift, we weren't expecting, first off, we weren't expecting him to, to be ready to do any kind of demo yet. And so he was like, yeah, I just finished building this thing like yesterday. I haven't tested it at all. Let's see if I can make it do the thing, right? He was super excited. So we're like, okay, you know, good luck. We're excited. Let's see what happens. And it, it did the tip over thing, which of course released a huge EMP and fried his computer, um, knocked out his space heater that he had there. <laughs> Think about how much juice is required to knock out a space heater. <laughs> like, that's not insignificant amount of, like, fry your brains kind of pulse. Oh, yeah. Um, anyways, but the fact that it tips over, to me that seems less like torsion fields, which that's Russian stuff, and he's Russian, so he, you know, thinks in terms of Russian pseudoscience -y type stuff, and they're all about the torsion fields. A lot of his stuff comes from Grebenikov as well, which was the Beetle Wings guy, right? Um, just by observing that tip over, though, it seems like it's an, an electrostatic lift of some kind. It seems like it's a lifting force of some kind, because it's lifting just one side instead of you know, up the center, it's lifting like that. Like all the charges went to one side instead of the other, or instead of both, as you mean. Yeah, so I've used I've used a magnet paper to map the eddy current in the middle there, and if you, it, it the eddy current is a very thin ring, like three millimeters wide, and it goes, follows the outside edge of the discs, right? Because that's right where the magnets are, is the outside edge of the disc. Um, and because all the charges want to collect on that sharp outer edge, you have all that rotating charge, plus you got the rotating magnets, that eddy current is a thin, strong, dark ring um, on the magnet paper right in the center of the thing. Well, if you got the two disks slightly off center, because it's really easy to do, because it's really hard to center things, um, now you got all of this magnetic part from the magnets is over here, and all the electrostatic side from the um, the top disc, right, is over here. There is a secondary eddy current in the top disc, right? The eddy current in the middle disc creates an eddy current in the top disc. There's a lot to unpack there, but suffice to say for now, the, the charge on the top disc and the magnetic strength from the bottom disc 
make that eddy current in the middle, um, if they're off center, right? Now you got your magnetic side over here, your electric side over here, and it does, eh, tips over. Gotcha. What do you guys think the magnets are actually for? So uh, are they pushing down when it moves because it's moving slower, or is it just the feel? You're saying it's the... It's the right yeah. hand rule. You got, uh, because the direction of rotation and the the charge is negative, so that's why those magnets have to be north up, is because it's going counterclockwise and it's um, negatively charged. If you wanted to have it positively charged, you would have it go clockwise and have it south up. Okay. So all the charges get concentrated onto these magnets. And uh, because you're following the right-hand rule or left-hand rule, whichever one you want to choose, um, that means that you're, you're getting an additional boost to that magnetic field because you're following the rules, right? Um, if you spun it clockwise, and that's all you did, but it was still negative and north up, uh, your eddy current strength goes way down. Okay. CBO effect, uh, the exotic vacuum objects. I don't know if you studied that with uh, Ken so Shoulders and uh, John Hodgson and Bob Green. Here. But they say you need, kind of need a magnetic field to help with EVO formation. And with John Hodgson's ball lightning experiments, you know, that's what he used. He had a spark gap and then magnetic field to kind of guide the uh, ball lightning help it form. Okay. You're saying like a big chamber with a magnetic field? So the center and then the outside? Yeah, I did a video and there's a screenshot of it, uh, the paper. But uh, yeah, they, they've done some research on his design. He just had a big spark gap that would annihilate like a little piece of aluminum. And then that charge would be focused, kind of pulled through a, a, ring, a bunch of rings of magnets huh. to create the ball lighting. It's interesting. Yeah, no one um, else has done it with John Hodgson. New. And ball yeah. lightning has all sorts of, you know, interesting, like, features to it, right? It's kind of like a self-resonant little plasma cavity that decays not very fast. And the Q factor inside that little ball of plasma is insanely high. Um, so, you know, a little gigahertz wave is bouncing around, like, a bajillion times inside there. And we've seen from a lot of other anti-gravity stuff out there that you want to have a really high Q factor, right? Like the M drive, their whole thing was you need at least a Q factor of 10,000, but 100,000 or a million would be way better, right? Um, resonant cavities are super important. I calculated the Q factor for Alexi's device based on when in the video where he takes off the, the thing off the battery in the outdoor video, and it stays in the air for like 20 seconds. Well, we know the general ballpark about how much juice he's using to get it up there. And we know, you know, it takes one joule of energy to raise a one kilogram mass one meter in the air, right? Well, that thing is sitting at about five meters in the air, and it's sitting there for 20 seconds. So that gives us some idea on the joules that are there, and we know how much it weighs. So, so you can figure out, like, how long does the thing continue to resonate before it decays enough that the thing falls out of the air before the effect goes away and according to those calculations he had a q factor of somewhere around 1500 which is pretty dang good the q factor for tesla coils is like usually in the ballpark maybe around 200 really good tesla coils you can get them to be about a thousand um when you vibrate the plates that mechanical vibration that has a Q factor, you know, the dampening factor in it as well. And that Q factor can be even higher. That can be closer to a thousand. Um, last thing I'll say on it, when you look at the stored energy, because in order for it to stay up there, it's gotta have a certain amount of stored energy that is decaying, right? Well, the rotation of the disks, that's about five joules per disk. That's, that's not enough to keep it five meters in the air. When you look at the amount of energy stored in the vibration, if these discs have an amplitude vibration of plus minus one millimeter, holy crap balls, man. You're talking thousands of joules of energy stored in there. So, and, and as far as like the, the magnetic energy and the eddy current, I don't think it's super high. It might be like a couple dozen joules, maybe a hundred joules, but I'd be very surprised if it was that high. So when you look at where all the energy in this thing is stored, the, the one place where the most is stored 
is in the vibration, which is where you hear the singing, which is where you have the change in capacitance, where's, which is where you have this back EMF thing going to the Tesla coil, right? So, so the resonance is, is the electric, electron excited, right? So it, it would amplify the effect. Uh, it's, it's, the electron is excited because it's sitting on top of a piece of metal that is doing this, right? And if you take an electron and you wiggle an electron, you get a, a current. So you get an AC current, right? If you take an electron and you just move it, you get a DC current. But if you wiggle it up and down, you get an AC current. Well, this thing here is the AC side. So this, this wiggling plate is creating an AC current. This is like a, a resonant cavity and that resonant RF resonant cavity. And that RF resonant cavity is coupled to this guy, which is an RF resonant thing. So that vibrating disc that's singing has all these electrons sitting on it, all the holes sitting on it for the top disc. And uh, that's creating like a, a remnant AC signal even after you pull off the, the, ba the battery terminal. But that's what, that's what I'm trying to get at. The, in the atom itself is where it's resonating. That's why the plate itself resonates. It, it, to get that higher value isn't that where it has to go? Because, you, you, you know, if, if you're just vibrating a plate, it's very low. It has a very, re very, very low resonance factor. But if you can get the atom to vibrate itself, you can get the resonance factor to increase. Does that make any sense to you? Like a guitar string, right? When you pluck a guitar string and it goes for, like, a nice long time, you can say it's it's the bonds between the molecules that is vibrating, right? You got that vibration phonon packet that's going down the string and back up the string right. And down, right? But at this level, I think it's better to think macroscopically, think think bigger, like the size of the plate, than it is to go all the way down to the the atomic level. Because if you go down to the atomic level, you got to be thinking in terms of like the the energy shells the electron shells right the energy levels of the elect of the the atoms and i don't think that we are ionizing these atoms to the point where they're starting to you know emit electrons like crazy because if they were doing that i i would expect that i would see a little more um radiation with the geiger counter there's a video infrared where you could see uh, plasmoids forming in Alex's video. He says those form right before lift up. I've been trying to replicate that next, but he has an IR camera and a uh, infrared light that uh, amplifies it. And he, he tunes in a special way, which he hasn't explained yet, but then there's uh, where it's still sitting on the ground, but then uh, you'll see plasma uh, spheres that'll appear like, like dust in the video. Where at? I'll send where, you, yeah. Where okay. out on the gravity flare? Uh, oh, from like 10 feet away from the gravity flyer, the okay. plasma ring around, yeah. Like kind of like one of those things when you see God, you see that big ring around it, something like that? Well, that what you look at? Probably different colors? Dust. No, it's the uh, same color. It's light that, you know, produce, it produced in the infrared light. You could pick it up as little balls of light that look like dust particles, and you start seeing like a, more of them as the tuning process gets closer to, to lift up. But they will fly in different directions, you know, sporadic. Uh, that you know, not like uh, normal dust. So he's a lot of people will speculate in other instances of uh, like security cameras that have seen the same plasmoids near like thunderstorms. Um, that it's dust or bugs, but it doesn't act like that. Although they they act differently. They are small. Uh, like an extremely erratic ball of light is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, like ball of lightning, but on a smaller scale. So it's like but the EVO effect. Kind of, kind of like the smallest little bug that flies around you that you can't get. That that about that's oh probably smaller, but I'm just saying in general something like and, that moving around and much kind slower excellent. moving, very very yeah. slow floating little what looks like dust particles, but they're yeah. extra shiny. Huh. interesting. Yeah, I've only seen those when I've been drunk, man. Uh, having a hangover, or something. Wake up the next morning, your brain's all messed up. That's I've seen those, but that's kind of like what you're describing. But I'm sure it's different. It, it looks like those little floaters that you'll see. Yeah, it, yeah. it looks just like that, but on camera. <laughs> it's different. 
Oh yeah. man, a hard night. Oh, yeah. it's bad. So where are you guys at with this thing? You guys got the plates going. You got, uh, I see this. So you're just trying to match the frequencies to get this thing running. Is that the last hurdle? Yep, I'm testing it. I like to find is the special sound before it takes off, but I've got the rest of the tuning process synced down and I'm able to hear the interaction between the fields and on a, on a radio. So I'm building a, a kit. I'm able to replicate everything that Alice sent me. I'm going to build the kit and ship it to him in this Pelican case. And hopefully he receives it in a few weeks or months. But he's still, he's been in the process of moving, so we haven't been able to contact him uh, recently. And yeah, I'll just be testing and yeah, I'm trying to get it to lift up. Uh, Jared has it on a scale, but I'm having, I'm t going for all or nothing where it'll fall over or it'll lift up. Then I'll know it's working. I like that a lot better. Some of those scales are just counteractive. It doesn't really work. Yeah, yeah I have a, a, dig a digital scale, and it. I'm not actually even using it anymore. I'm just looking for the string to go slack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm concerned that the feet need to be grounded because they're connected to the AC as well, and they're a part of the circuit, so maybe that, that charge or that help with the AC signal to the center plate if the legs are connected to ground. I'm testing on carpet, but I don't want to test on outdoors. Alex, you only tested on tile and outdoors. Also, I was using 50 hertz, so my circuit, you know, at 60 hertz here in the U.S. Is well, I can tell you, don't, 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 don't do it on wood. That That's a bad idea. It just sucks down to the wood even, even worse. So... Yeah, I like that video you had with the, the bolts that had ground itself down into the table. Oh. <laughs> you know, people always say, does it have a like, like a factor where it can lift? Well, yeah, any capacitor does. When you put it downward, man, that force is real fast. It, 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 it's quicker than you think. And before you know it, they're digging in. I can have plastic bolts in and dig in the wood, which drives me insane. Like, how do you do that? Like, that's some force. Mm -hmm. But it, it's done it. And they always, always, I always try to explain this to people. There's different factors in these things. It's not just one. They keep thinking it's like, oh, do this one thing, and then you got anti gravity. And it's like, not even close, buddy. You got like three or four different things you got to figure out before you even can attempt to be on that level where you can figure out the fifth or sixth thing to go on. And it's hard to make people see that because they say comments all the time. You guys probably get them too. You know what I mean? I get the grinder guy all the time. Well, your disc is a little bit out of balance. You can grind the side of it. Or you didn't place this right. And then, you know, anytime you put any kind of string next to it, oh, my God, they freak out. So, <laughs> I, I mean, that's why I, you see the big exercise thing when I did the uh, uh, with the fog test because I wanted to make it very clear that that's what it was. I didn't need some idiot going on there. Oh, my God, look, he's using strings. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It, I get a lot of people, man. They, you guys probably get it too. It's just a little whack out there sometimes. Sometimes they're you know right in line with where you're at, and then sometimes it's like two ships passing in the night, man. We're just not on the same page. I just remember Alexi and how Alexi had to come out like after his first videos, and he had to like go through step by step like debunking all the debunkers' claims, right? And there was like one Russian guy who like made a whole like debunking video of Alexi's stuff. And Alexi goes against his video and he goes through his stuff one by one. He's like, no, this is what's happening here. This is what's happening here. This is what's happening. So like if Alexi, who got, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of views on all these things and had, had to deal with all the, the naysayers, yeah. he can do it. And he's like a shut-in, like he's super shy, he doesn't deal well with people telling him, you know, you're full of shit. Like, he doesn't deal well with any of that stuff. Well, I can tell you that. If he can handle all of that bullcrap from people, then we sure as hell should be able to. And we only got, you know, a, a very small number of people who are pooping on our parade. Yeah. If people were saying, you know, the rebar in the floor was what was repelling against the meta, so he went outdoors. He's like, all right, I'll do the t outdoor test. And, you know, they're like, oh, there's strings in the roof. And but like, no, then they said there's a drone lifting it with strings or electromagnet. So he had to pan up and scan around. He had to walk around it. And the uh, stick. Just, the stick. Yeah, the stick. Put his uh, hand it. It yeah, I, I avoid that whole video that uh, has all the negative stuff in it. I won't even put that on my channel. It's just not so counterproductive. You know what I mean, I don't mind, you know, 
uh, just looking at it myself and seeing what I observe is fine. But anything past that, man, because some of the videos, they're so grainy that they're, they're, you can't tell what's going on there. It, it's like it could be the best thing in the world, but the video is so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we joke that he's a potato covered in Vaseline for his video camera. We yeah. got him a new camera. So send him a camera is what you should do. That's yeah. We, we got know. him a, a nice iPhone with a like iPhone camera, right? So it's oh, like really? the best. Yeah, so it's the best <laughs> camera. So that um, there's another video I should share with you. The indoor video that he did. It's like the most recent video he sent us. It was right after his indoor lift um, Zoom call with us, which was with the webcam on his computer. And we're like, use your phone for the call dude yeah. <laughs> and and he's like I can't it'll fry my phone which is a valid concern considering that it, if it managed to fry his space heater you know and it fried the hard drive on his laptop um, it, you know it makes sense why he's concerned about this really nice you know shiny iPhone he doesn't want to mess it up but he, he still managed to get us a video uh, of Lyft with the iPhone and even that is like maybe 480p. I don't know how he manages to get such crummy video, but I think part of it is all of the electromagnetic interference you get. Like, you can't get good quality video um, during lift, especially if you are a guy who doesn't even know how to use a freaking multimeter. Yeah. Well, I can tell you this from doing high voltage experiments, you have to have the camera far away. Anything up close, you're just getting, uh, you know, like the old TVs where you get the little lines that go through it and they keep going up and down. I get those a lot when I do high voltage videos. So it's usually like five to 10 feet back. And then I have to put a, you know, a scope thing on it to get it to uh, zoom in good to, because those shots aren't clear. And it's so hard because you have to do everything at night. So I want to, you know, building a big vacuum chamber to get this thing where I can put the whole gravity flyer in it. That's that's my goal. I've got all the parts. I just got to put it together. So it it's not fun, man. And then in those things, I noticed they put a lot of aluminum. So they cook the wire to the outside of the aluminum and then the inside's a positive. That's how they get that thing to pull apart from what I've seen. I don't know if you guys have seen something different, but that's how I see that thing working. I don't want any of that. I just want the thing in there and charged on its own so I can see it. So I built it out of wood. So I don't know if that'll help you guys in your testing at all later on, but I want to see where the particles are going. You know what I mean? So it, because if you can start to see any kind of ions in there at all, you know, any kind of discoloration, then it'll help. So at least that's my thought on it. Yeah, we always joke, uh, it's not rocket science, it's harder. <laughs> so, so it's difficult to get everything tuning, resonating properly for the lift. But we think we're, the, we think we're close. And hopefully we could build you a kit or uh, send you some parts or help you along with your testing. Because if one of us replicates it, then it's kind of a win for everyone. I feel the same way. Same way. I'm actually building a third one. I'm going to build it like you guys did. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw uh, Mike... Uh, I think it's Mike W or something like that. M? M, there you go. His gravity flyer, I kind of oh. want to put the motors like he did. I always want the little less weight, you know what I mean? Because the magnets are so heavy in this thing. It always sets things off. And then, uh, you know, just the all threads and stuff like that. Yeah, so. the type of magnets he's using, I have like a cup on, a steel cup, which probably helps shield it from the high voltage and... Uh, I get from KJ Magnetics. Yeah, it's harder to get a. It, it, it's harder to get the magnetic wave out of it. In a spinning magnet, usually you could take a coil, put it right next to it, and get a value. These, they, they're shielding it. Yeah, on his like how what he uses to insulate the high voltage uh, from the motors, just a little piece of uh, insulating material, and this was the motor. What is that? The material is pretty light. It's like a Foam almost. Uh, uh, plastic? Yeah, like a plastic. It's pretty, you know, it's 100% infill. It's not 3D printed or anything. It's something he found and modified that'll insulate it. And oh. the magnets are bolted on with the, the cup. He said these only these type of magnets have worked, and they're, they're about N42 strength. If you don't want too strong of magnets, or else there'll be too much eddy currents, and then the motors will overheat. 
You can't get too close with the discs, so I think N42 is the way to You can also 3D print your own like spacer thing, like that white thing. Um, you just have to get one of these high voltage testers. I think I picked this up on like eBay or AliExpress for like 60 or 70 bucks. Um, and this thing can test it up to like 5,000 volts. But the idea is that you want to make sure that it's at least like 20 to 22 giga ohm. Um, it, and if it's more than that, you're golden. And I 3D printed a couple here recently um, that you can see are these black guys right here. Um, and I mean, yeah, it's more than this thing can measure, which is great. That means it's more than like 25 giga ohm. Uh, and you guys for the motors uh i found these little electric car motors are really good okay. they are brushed instead of alexi's fan motors which are brushless the brushless motors all the emi that you're getting um really messes those up and you can get arcing inside there which will burn those motors up really fast so we've, yep, noticed, did that. we've noticed that the speeds on the fan motors that he sent us that those speeds have gone down with just you know a couple dozen hours worth of testing um so these guys though i can get ballpark call it maybe 30 to 75 hours of testing out of one of these before usually it's the bearings that go bad um but these are like 20 bucks each which i mean that's not bad uh they're super torquey um you can hook them up with uh pwms right amazon 20 25 bucks for the pwms um I have noticed that these PWMs can be a little sensitive to the high voltage. Uh, so if it does somehow arc back into the motor, which usually I think is happening through the motor wires, which are, you know, there's no way to get around that. I mean, unless you're going to try to shield those wires somehow. But anyways, I can shoot you a link uh, if you want for some of these um, motors, which, you know, I buy like four of them at a time. So I always have an, a spare one on hand. Um, and I think I've only gone through three of them, like in the past <laughs> year. So, pretty good. Yeah, it's a lot of parts you buy for this thing. You really don't realize it until you start blowing something up. I have fried my last motors. I I dumped a bunch of voltage in there, man. Just I just wanted to see what it would do, and it well, it popped and blew everything. <laughs> so all, all the way back, man, it, it went. What a, the ESCs blew up. Uh, I had my batteries get damaged from it. Everything, man. I, well, I threw 300 volts of DC into it just to see what it would do. And, well, yeah, it acted like an air capacitor and it boom, up in smoke in <laughs> seconds. I managed yeah. to burn out one of these program, one of these uh, like tabletop power supplies that you get off Amazon. For like oh, yeah. Bucks. Yeah, burnt out one of those from the Tesla coil and the high voltage like arcing. Right, so somehow it, it arced to the center plate, which went to the test coil, which went to the power supply. That's why I use those little power packs. Right? Because you blow them up, throw it away, get another one, they're cheap. Those power supplies get expensive after a while. Oh, yeah. yeah. These these guys are, yeah, are those. super, super cheap. They're like 15 bucks. Yeah, they like can these. only provide three amps. Yeah, if these go bad, you could always... Buy a new one and return it. <laughs> Same new <as> defective. Kind <laughs> destroy them. Yeah, yeah I don't kind of do that. If I blow it up, I blew it up. <laughs> kind of one of those things. So that yeah, uh, but it it's not. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. I don't think that you're getting any more than static volts out of them. So why would you need any more than like one amp in uh, twelve volts in order to run the uh, DC? Yeah, the AC yeah. would be a little different. The, yeah, the mistake, mistake I think for everyone to use more power, but that's kind of counterintuitive for most people. <laughs> I think you're definitely using too much power <laughs> compared to what Alex is using. Well, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. This thing is relatively low power. It, <laughs> it's it's mostly just generating the fields. That's kind of what it's doing, right? You you got sound and you got fields and you got frequency in there, and that's it. That's all that's going on. The Tesla <laughs> coil has multiple different ways that it'll resonate um so when you have it at low power you'll get you know a bunch of nice even spikes but then as you crank the power up those even spikes go away and it just dumps all the power into the 1.2 right so 
Uh, and then I think there's a third resonance mode there, too, where, like, instead of dumping it into the 1.2, it dumps it into the 390 or the 3 meg, I forget. But the idea that the Tesla coil can have these multiple different ways that it can resonate, and Alexi is, like, swinging through all of those as he's doing the potentiometer, um, there might be a there, there. The, the Slayer circuits, I've noticed... They really like to burn out when you go above about 0.9 amps, <laughs> and I've I've ran them at like 10 amps for about 10 minutes. Oh, so you're lucky you got 10 minutes out of it. <laughs> yeah, I was very happy that I got 10 minutes. <laughs> but oh man, the spikes that I was getting on the scope were gorgeous for those 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Yeah, those things suck, man. I don't, uh, I don't like using them at all. But so you okay. have feedback. What do you guys think about the center plate? I see uh, the one behind you. Uh, yeah, right there. It has the textured aluminum. But the one that Char Charlie sent me on the original one had this flat. Yeah, you so, flat. Yeah. You so flat? Our, our thinking right now is that <clears throat> if you want to have uh, the best resonance, then everything should be the exact same like thickness and the exact same like material and everything so you get that sympathetic resonance as much as possible um this one that i have right now i've scaled it up so this is much bigger than alexi's you know original eight inch and 16 inch this one okay. is like 11 or 12 inches and like 22 or 23 inches something like that um maybe 21 inches um but the one really cool thing about it being much bigger is that the edges you get a lot more deflection right and so my thinking is that if you get more deflection that means those that complex capacitance of pins that changing capacitances right that uh you'll get a lot more um electromagnetic like back emf and a lot you know the the em side of things will act a lot better plus you know that vibrational energy the bigger this thing gets uh the more nodes you're gonna have Right, so maybe more stored energy. Hmm. So, is there anything to the texture on the plates? Better it, capacitance with the textured um, discs. So, when you're charging it with the high voltage, it'll uh, have a larger charge. That's because I see a lot of a lot of flat plates out there. I noticed about an extra ten to fifteen percent capacitance with the textured versus the smooth, which is not a lot, honestly. Um, I tried, one thing I tried was I bought some um, sulfuric acid and I had one of these plates sitting in the sulfuric acid for like a couple days um, and then took it out and washed it off and everything. And I measured the capacitance then thinking that if I can get a bunch of micro etching pores on it, more surface area, more capacitance. Nope. I have another plate that's been sitting in there for about two months now. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of scared to spin that up. It might be a little too brittle. <laughs> but. Uh -huh. Man, things you try when you try to get this thing to work, huh? Well, the, the payoff, if this thing works, you know, the world is a different place. Yeah. No kidding. That'd be awesome. That, that's all I want. It's, yeah. you know what I mean? But independently verified yeah, is an important step in science and that's the next step for us and especially here in the United States getting it to work we could you know, demo it to people so that's what we're trying to do so if yeah, you need any help getting yours put together or anything we could do we have more time than you probably so we could uh, ship it to you if you're available or yeah I'll keep in touch with you guys I mean look I, I'm going to rebuild it and when I do I'm going to throw some tests in it and I'm going to get that oscilloscope working so I'm going to take the time to learn it, and then uh, I'll, that way I can give you guys the results where you guys can replicate or do whatever, or we can match ideas. Because right now, I just tune it by ear, and I can tell you right now, it's not resonating hard enough. There, there's no way. I would uh, really recommend... Um, there's a circuit we can send you the design for. Um, it's like a breadboard, a capacitor, and a couple of resistors, right? It's it's not anything fancy. But what it is, is you get these little optical sensors, and you put some reflective tape on there. 
and that's how I'm able to measure the RPMs in real time. And I think being able to measure the RPMs in real time gives you a huge advantage for being able to tinker and see when I do this, how does it affect that, right? And really, right. this changes in speed are pretty much one of the only things that you have to go off of. Changes in speed, changes in frequency, and changes in uh, charge. Those are the three things that you can measure, right? Well, changes in charge, I've noticed that when you measure the charge, you mess it up, right? Just by getting close to the thing, you mess it up before it lifts. You mess it up. Um, changes in frequency, this thing has so much RF EMI craziness that it's a nightmare trying to actually measure that stuff when it's running, um, mostly from the high voltage. So that leaves you with pretty much just the RPMs. So if, if you'd like, I, I would highly recommend um, doing that. I think the sensors are like seven or 10 bucks each. And, and the circuit, you know, is, you know, probably another 10 bucks worth of resistors and capacitors at most, if you don't already have them. Um, and so you just hook it up to your scope and push measure frequency and now you got the frequency in hertz. Gotcha. Yeah, send me that schematic because I'll definitely build some of those. Yeah, because I want to get this thing rolling. It's been too long, man. Right down so, so I remember what to send you. We got the motors. And we got yep. the RPM schematic. Yeah, because I can only go off of the tests that I've done to it. You know what I mean? I can only tell you how it works based on those. I couldn't tell you what you guys are working on. You know what I mean? Well, I think considering, uh, you know, how little you've had to go on, I mean, Charles has had, you know, a couple of the actual devices, right? And and he's had email correspondence with Alexi, and, you know, he's had a lot of stuff. For, for how little stuff you've had and how much progress you've been able to make on your own without having that stuff, bro, like, you're kicking it out of the ballpark here. <laughs> Right on. I'm trying. So, of your attempts, yeah. Hopefully, we can give you more information in, in the share drive. There's also uh, Excel for the uh, tuning instruction award document. I think for more of the tuning details. And yeah, I've had several clips of the emails he sent over the years. And then at the end is our interpretation of the tuning process. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it That's sounds like. Important. Yeah. So it, it has steps in how you go down each one. All right, essentially you want to turn on the motors and we use the PWM to have, kind of quickly ramp them up to full speed, have them running for a few minutes till they get to full speed, then turn on the high voltage DC with the flyback and slowly uh, ramp it up, you know, a little turn each uh, minute, minute and a half uh, for 15 to 20 minutes. And once that, that full charge before any, without any sparking, then you turn on the high voltage AC Tesla coil and uh, you let it sit for five seconds and then start adjusting that. Uh, and you would adjust from the, the maximum to the minimum that kind of increases the amplitude and frequency a little bit of the Slayer Exciter and then uh, he turns on the ultrasound and adjusts the Tesla coil and the ultrasound at the same time until he hears a, a certain noise then he pulses the ultrasound uh, he turns it off and then waits five seconds turns it off and, and waits four seconds and turns it off three two one and then it'll lift up so he, he's looking for a resonance frequency through the whole thing. Yep, is, is what he's got. Yeah, with the ultrasound is the trick of uh, getting it to resonate and then hearing the resonant frequencies and then uh, pulsing it till it resonates enough to lift. And each of those steps affects the speeds, right? So when you just turn on the discs by themselves, it takes a couple of minutes for them to like even out because that eddy current in the mid plate is starting to build up, right? And that eddy current affects everything. Um, so once it's kind of like heated up the metal and, and gotten like the magnetic spins of the aluminum or something aligned, right? It takes about three to five minutes before the speeds have kind of like evened out. Then when you turn on the high voltage, now the speeds change again and you know, you got this interplaying everything. And then that eventually by the end of the high voltage step evens out. Then you turn on the Tesla coil. Well, the Tesla coil amplifies the magnetic strength of that eddy current. <laughs> so once again, you got this thing. And like you might have seen in my video, like when the two speeds get really close together, that's when they can like shoot off one way or the other. Yeah. And like a lot of stuff changes, really non-linear chaotic stuff. 
And since every step is changing the RPMs, and the RPMs can change the RPMs. Gotcha. Yeah, I like your double flyback uh, design, so I replicated that, and it works pretty well. I've even added some wax to prevent from leaking you know, high voltages that way from the pins. And <laughs> I, I just in a vacuum chamber, it works uh, up to very low <laughs> vacuum near space. So it's a good design for multiple purposes. Just uh -huh. a little. That, that circuit right there is the same circuit that I used on my little paper lifter yep. because it pulled out more amps. Right. It, it gave me more static volts right there. Yeah, that, That's so why I used good. it. Yeah. yeah, just concerned it'll be a little bit different from Alex's circuits. I'm trying to stay as close to his original circuits as possible for testing until I figure it out. But it'll probably, yeah, hopefully be able to replace with something like this that works better, more durable. Yeah. Well, what it sounds like is once you get the values, you just basically take an Arduino and, uh, you know, just calculate the, the stops, where you know, a parameter where you need to be in. And then you can run it through, and it'll automatically set for you in the end, right? It's kind of the goal, right? I'd like to know that. Yeah, I've already started the auto-tuning process, what we call it. And it uses an Arduino, and it connects to servos, which it adjusts in 3D printed uh, knobs. So it can manually adjust the knobs instead of us physically, you know, doing it. Well, yeah, because that's that's the only way to go for from here on in. If you're going to make it rep, rep, uh, if you want to replicate it for other people, you have to. Because tuning it the way you guys are tuning it, the way I'll end up tuning it, is not going to be like that. I'm hoping that what we'll be able to do is once we get decent enough at the tuning process, um, that we can start iterating on the design to make it so it's not just like use this and then use a, an Arduino to like, you know, sweep through stuff and find the sweet spot until it lifts. That still might take you a solid 20 plus minutes to get this thing off the ground. And I want to be able to see this thing get off the ground in like five minutes or less. So uh, a different design, specifically if we can get one that doesn't require moving parts, right? I really liked your, your idea of uh, using that bifilar winding on the mid plate, right? Um, I think that's like going in the right direction, but uh, instead of doing it on the mid plate to have that be the rotors, right? The spinning discs. So what you're doing is you're spinning uh, a charge by having it go around a wire and you can move that a couple hundred or, you know, times more orders of magnitude faster than you can get these things to spin. These things can only spin that charge at, you know, 30 hertz. But if you have a wire, you can spin that charge around at, you know, megahertz. Gotcha. Yeah, the bifilar coil, man, it added a lot of weight. I mean, a lot of weight. And vibration. And the thing was going wild. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I did that video, man, and I was just testing the motors. And I get so many people saying, oh, man, it's about to lift off. You know, it ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, not even close, but it sure vibrates a lot. Mm -hmm. So, ah, well, it's probably one of the most viewed videos I have on my site, man. They they keep viewing that. They're trying to see something that's not there, and it's just, it's unfortunate, but, and you try to explain, but it's so hard for people to understand it. It weighs th less than three pounds. I'm talking like two and a half pounds is what my gravity flyer weighs. There's, I mean, it's got plastic bolts in it. It's got little tiny motors in it. I mean, the metal doesn't weigh that much. I got rid of all the all threads in there, so it, it, you know, barely any weight in this thing, man. The only way I could get rid of more weight is to make some 3D printed parts on it. Yeah, that's, that's what I did. I, I 3D printed a ton of parts for this thing so that I could get rid of some weight because I was going bigger. And I think that saved me about a half a pound by going 3D printed. <laughs> yeah, I reduced the weight. Has under a kilo. Yeah, I'm using a plastic cup for the lighter weight and a uh, laser cut acrylic for strength and uh, you know, non conductive arms, I'm calling them. The legs, I made M3 instead of M5. Hmm. And everything else is like one millimeter as thin as possible. And then the motors, I cut down. So it's just the essential part, little, as little as possible, and then glued it to that and I glued some foam as the insulator between the high voltage and the discs. And that's as light as I think I can make it. And it might be too light because <laughs> I don't know if it, if there needs to be a little bit of mass on it. So. so I got a question for you. Do you think the weight is actually helps it uh, as far as the mass of material 
in its lift process because you're getting more of every, all the charges everywhere versus yeah. if it's yeah. not all put together. Does that make yeah, sense? He's yeah, he's not too concerned about the mass of his. Like He's using bolts and uh, nuts to hold together frames and this uh, the arms are a lot of extra mass and the cone even has a lot of extra so it's really amazing that he got to fly and might need that extra mass to fly i'm not sure yet well that's what i'm getting at the more metal you have because it's all one circuit in the end it, mm -hmm. it's all combined so it's all one circuit so the charges are not just building up on the center plate and top and bottom it's building up on the outside as well so if we start changing things where it doesn't have that circuit that goes through the whole thing, then you won't get that charge on the outside. Does that make sense? Very, very good observation. Um, right now we have a guy that we've hired to do some 3D modeling for us uh, to like model all the fields and everything that are interacting. We're hoping it's going to come back soon with, you know, this is what you need to do. But uh, for now, it looks like the metal rods that go vertically well, in the tip over videos, you see those sparks, right? That means that there's also a super high charge at the top of those things as well. That's so what I'm getting at, yeah. You have an electric field that is going this way as well as this way. Exactly what T.T. Brown was saying. You saw the capacitor, you saw it in the center. Most people don't know that it's left and right and top and bottom in that capacitor. And that's why they get it wrong. So that's why I had a lift force where other things don't. That, that's what I'm saying. This is one big charge ball is basically what it's going to come down to. So he needs some more mass in order to get actually more ions on the outside of it. Or, you know what I'm saying, more polarity, whatever you want to say it is. That's what he's getting because of the weight, or just the amount of metal. If you think of it as gravity shielding, and maybe it doesn't matter how much it is. If it's shielded from gravity, then it's kind of... Lifting up by itself, as John Hodgson shown, he, he lifted a cannonball, and that thing weighs a lot, and he's lifted other several tons of equipment. Well, that's what I was trying to say in my video. So if you push out all the other stuff from forcing against it, then in itself, you know what I mean? It creates a little bubble, and that's that's what I'm, it's isolated. Now, I don't care if the bubbles, you know, has different, looks like an H or anything else. It's still creating a field around it. field separates it from the rest of the fields going on around it. So you're, you're creating its own. And that's what the actual anti-gravity effect is. It's not a lifting effect. The lifting effect is in the capacitor plates and how they work together in the heights and stuff. Because I don't see it going down. But, uh, he don't crash this thing into the ground. It only goes one way. And the only way to say that is the bottom plate has a different distance than the upper plate. So he, he's creating a force going in one direction. It seems kind of like there's a ratcheting effect, right? So it's creating lift for some amount of time, and it's not creating lift for another amount of time, right? And the amount of time that it's creating the, the, the lift and the amount of lift that it's creating is more than the time that it's not, right? So because of that ratcheting effect, it seems like the vibrations of things, uh, it seems like it's, you know, kind of That's picking it up. That's why I asked you about the dump circuit. So when you take the transducer and you hook it to that piezoelectric disc, right? It, it charges, charges into a capacitor, and then all of a sudden dumps, right? As soon as it hits the right value, it, it hits. That's why I ask about that. So every time that it hits a high value in that, it boom, it hits, and then it jumps. And it's kind of like walking on a spiral staircase up it. So every time it jumps, it's going up just a little bit all the way up. It's not going, you know what I mean, where it's a steady lift. It doesn't look like that at all. It, it looks like it has like a dump feature. So like when you talk about resonance, you ring a bell, right? So you take it and you hit it to the side and it rings the bell. Well, there, there's a resonance in the bell. So the maximum value you can get out of that resonance is every time you hit the side of it. So it'll peak in value. And that's what I mean by a dump circuit. You're getting all of it at once so that it amplifies everything at once. So if you had a field like this, the field would pulse, just like that. I don't think that this thing has a steady field, if that makes sense to you. I think it has a pulsed field, and, that, and that's what's, what's forcing it out. Yeah, 
I, I like that. Yeah, didn't yeah. Alex say he adjust the frequency of the, of the Tesla coil and the ultrasound at the same time, not just the height of it somehow? The, that's another thing you should know about. So we asked him, he said that the ultrasound controlled the height. And so finally we got him out of, well, how? Do you turn down the frequency or do you turn up the frequency to make it go up? He finally told us that you turn up the frequency to make it go up. And when you turn up the frequency of the ultrasound, you got to tweak the Tesla coil to keep everything in resonance, right? Um, so I think that's a super important detail because if you're going up in frequency, that means the wavelength is getting smaller. We already know that these frequencies he's dealing with are like thickness of the plates level, level frequencies, right? Or distance of the, the things. Either way, um, if you go from, you know, 45 kilohertz to 90 kilohertz, now you got two wavelengths in the same spot where you used to only have one wavelength. So if you have more wavelengths in a given space, that's more energy in a given space. So that kind of makes sense how turning up the frequency could increase it. One other important thing on this, I measured the capacitance and resistance of the piezo through the whole the whole spectrum, right? I did all the way up to like a megahertz. And I found that uh, up around the 100 kilohertz range, uh, it's, it's like the capacitance does this. It starts down at like 10 kilohertz and it's really, you know, decent capacitance. And then as you go up towards, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, it, you know, gets really low. And then as you get towards like, 80, 90, 100, 120, it starts going up again, and you get up to like a megahertz and it's like a ton of capacitance over there, right? Um, that capacitance, the amount of charge that that little piezo can have on it might be a really important detail because as you're increasing the frequency, that means you're increasing the capacitance, the total amount of juice that it can store for each pulse, right? So it's not just that you can have two wavelengths in the space of, you know, what was one wavelength by doubling the frequency. It's also that you're like doubling the capacitance, the overall amount of charge that it can have as well. Yeah, well, it, it also seems like, how does this, the magnets move just a hair. If you slow it down, if you slow down the disc, right? And you create a heavy enough force, you can push those magic that magnets down. I'm not talking a lot, maybe like, you know, five millimeters or something. Is it doing any of that when, when, when he's doing it? You mean yeah, the, I, the I, magnets I, that are attached with a screw to the disc, it's pushing the whole I, thing I, down like that? The whole plate, when you put on the magnet, say you had another magnet above it and you it forced it down a little bit. I'm asking if he, when he puts in that, uh, that transducer and he hits it, are the magnets moving just a slight hair? Just, just a little bit down. You know what I mean? Is that or jumping effect is that so that that goes back to the vibration of the discs right the the outside edges of the disc moving up and down um which you can tell kind of how much those are moving up and down based upon how loud your grinding of the beat frequency between the two is as well as um on the scope uh that chirp that i was talking about that you see from the beat frequency uh, as they grind harder, right? And every single grind slows down the speed, right? So it's like fast grind, slow, ungrind, fast, right? And it's doing crum, crum, crum. Well, on the scope, on the spectrum analyzer, uh, louder grinding or more slowing down like that equates to bigger spikes, more back EMF is, is happening when those things are getting deflected downwards more due to heavier magnetic grinding. Right, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out, is he creating enough eddy current in the aluminum itself to force the magnets to move? It, it is, I'm trying to figure out the exact jumping point. So if you got this thing that jumps up just a little bit, is there is there enough eddy current there to force the magnets down a little bit to get it to jump. So like, say for instance, you go to a theme park and you're on the UFO ride, right? You all slide up the wall, okay? But if you hold down one side of it and it's, it goes up for all of them and then one has to go back down and go up, it creates that little bump so that it'll jump every time, just like that. 
That's what I'm getting at. That, so are you familiar with Jim Woodward's uh, Mega Drive? No. So that uh, basically is like a transducer, and it's got this mass that's moving on it, and it's asymmetric damping, right? So it accelerates really hard one way and then decelerates really soft the other way. And so it's doing this, right? And that thing has been shown to produce like a force. So like it's, it's a good thing. It does work but it's just very little amounts of force. But the, this concept of asymmetric damping, of letting it accelerate really hard one way and then not accelerate very hard the other way, that's kind of what you're describing with these things. Um, the only way that works is if uh, when the magnets are in you know, their up flip, right? The thing where you get in a momentum jump upwards, that they're allowed to do that really fast and then for the pull down, they're doing that super slow, right? Because when you go back to physics, you know, equal and opposite reactions, right? The only way you can get around the equal and opposite reaction thing is with this asymmetry. It's like a pendulum that's swinging, but when it swings one way, it's swinging towards a magnet. And it swings away, it swings towards a magnet. It swings away, right? Right, but, you, but you're also getting an energy spike though. So you got to take that into account. So if you're getting more energy at one time, then it would make sense that you would have a repulsion. If it makes more eddy current in it, do you get a repulsion there? And it would go faster just at one point because it spikes electricity. So you wouldn't get equal and opposite right away. You get an immediate jump. Does that make sense? Because you're in your testing, you keep getting those spikes and your spikes happen, so it means that you're getting something in there that's forcing it, right? So it's not going to be a steady feature throughout it, but it means that every once in a while, you get a spike. Every once in a while, you get a spike, which would make more sense for the jumping that we're seeing. You don't get the spikes when the high voltage is turned off. So those, those uh, chirps that I'm talking about, uh, they don't really show up I take that back. I disregard that. I take that back. If you have the high voltage off, but you have the Tesla coil on, you'll get those spikes. But you need high voltage of some kind, either DC or AC. You need that high voltage there. Which means that the the grinding, the hrm, hrm, where that's changing distance to the, the center disc, um, that's that complex capacitance and gains that I was talking about, right? Uh, those spikes are back emf so it's like the energy that's required to turn the the disc uh that's getting converted into electrical energy that's going back into the tesla coil right so for each one of those grinds that slows down the disc well that was energy that you had to put into the disc to get it up to that speed and now that slows down the disc and that slowing down of the disc is because that magnet is clo at the closer point to the eddy current. It's closer point to the, the mid plate. Um, and that closer point is like forcing all of this rotating energy into magnetic energy, into eddy current energy into Tesla coil. So as far right. as, as this springing though of being the cause of lift, I don't think that's the primary cause because this electrostatic component of everything that's like slowing stuff down or speeding it up or changing all these but that's what fields. You're still making an energy difference. The difference between the two could be causing it. Even if it's not moving the magnets, it's the energy in between the two because you're having spikes everywhere. This isn't like it's a once in a while thing. This is all the time. So it could just be the spikes themselves that are causing the lift. You know what I mean? So it's hitting a, a, a much higher value or a much lower value. So you're getting a, a, a huge upside and a, a huge, you know, just like a roller coaster. You know what I mean? It's got to be something like that that's causing the lift because it's the only consistent thing in there along with the consistent lift. I don't think it's a mechanical thing. I think, it, I think it's a field effect with the ultrasound interaction with the... Well, like I, I, I agree. It could be a whole energy thing, but I'm saying it's the same effect, though, right? Uh, I don't care if you call it eddy current. I don't care if you call it, you know, ions trap into this thing. I, I don't care which way you say it. There's a difference in it. 
there's there's like a spike. You know, I don't, I don't care how you want to describe it. It's it's there, right? I think. So I, think the, it, I think it's important to define whether or not it's electrical or mechanical, though. Well, I I agree, but where it comes from is important. So if we know that the difference in the two is making the lift, that helps us out in figuring it out. If we know we're just creating a field and then the difference in the two makes a lift, then you have your lift factor, right? So now, whether it's mechanical or whether it's electrical, it really, you know, apples and oranges here to me right now and where you're at in it, it's more of, hey, where's the isolation of the point it's doing it? So if it's the energy spikes, that we know they're creating a lift, we have something to go on to have a lift factor. If I mean, it, right now. If it's mechanical, that means you're focusing more on disc thickness and, you know, tightness of the rods, right? How taut you have the disc. Um, I like mechanical is all about the material properties, right? Uh, if it's electrical, it's everything else, right? It's all these wires, it's all the piezo, it's all, it's everything else. And right now it's like, the, the question is where do we put our focus? Do we put our focus like I'm doing, which is changing the materials by making them bigger? Or do we put our focus more on the fields like Charles is doing, where it's like, no, keep all the materials exactly the same, just play around with the fields until you find the right spot, right? So right now, Charles and I kind of have these two different angles that we come at it with. I'm the the wild card, try all the new things, and Charles is the, I am going to follow this recipe to the letter, and I am going to do what he did. I just think your answer is in the spikes. And, and, and I'm saying, get rid of the mechanical, go with the energy, it's in that spike that you're getting the lift. That's what I'm saying. It, right there in that is where your lift factor is. It's the only thing that changes. It, it, if, if everything is pretty much I want to say this. If you're on a grading scale, right, and you say in between these two lines, well, everything's in here. When you get to the spikes, everything goes out here. And it starts messing around with everything. That's what I'm saying. The spike is your lift. When you have the discs perfectly tuned and in resonance and everything, and there isn't a beat frequency, or the beat frequency is super slow because they're so close, uh, the, the chirps, they don't go up or down. They just sit there, right? And it's really cool when you get to just sit there because you can kind of increase the power of it just a little bit more, right? Because they're not decaying, they're not increasing, it's just sitting there. But where they sit, the frequency is like way too high for any of the numbers that Charles, or that uh, Alexi has given us because the, the spot where it likes to sit is like 25 to 50 megahertz, which is dumb because <laughs> like... That's, that's so far outside of the one to maybe three megahertz of the Tesla coil. Um, that's way above any of the ultrasound, right? It's just, it's just so far away from anything that that makes sense. Well, how much are your spikes registered when you uh, get them? What's the total value there? Uh, so I'm measuring them in dBm. So like RF energy dB. Um, and... The Tesla coil, when you have everything like perfect for the Tesla coil, you can get like maybe three to six or seven dB, which is a pretty good amount. Um, that's like five to 10, maybe 20 watts um, RF energy. Um, I don't get it there. Uh, most of my RF stuff is showing down closer to like the negative 40 to negative 20, right? So you're in the, the milliwatt or even microwatt range of RF um, because the eddy current is not got a lot of amps of current in it, right? It's like milliamps, very low milliamps of current in that eddy current. And that eddy current is the thing that is causing in the Tesla coil the chirps to go up or down, right? So as you mess with that eddy current, you're messing with the chirps up and down. Here's another important thing that you might appreciate. Um, if you take the center plate and you slice it along the thin, right? So you look at the top half and the bottom half of that one millimeter thick plate, the top disc, the, the bottom disc is causing an eddy current, right? A counterclockwise eddy current in it, right? 
And then the top disc spinning the other way is like fighting that eddy current, right? So it's like the eddy current from the bottom disc is going this way, and the eddy current from the top disc is going this way. So it's kind of like the top disc is like pulling on that eddy current, right? And when you look at the magnetic field strength on the bottom and top of that eddy current, it's usually about a third, maybe a fourth of the, of the magnetic strength on top as it is on bottom. So on bottom, you're getting like 26 gauss. On the top, you're getting like three to eight gauss, right? So that can kind of tell you, okay, so on the bottom, uh, if I'm still looking at this thing split down the middle, right? That means that I'm using about three fourths of the distance has got a magnetic field pointed, you know, one way. And then the top quarter has a magnetic field pulled the other way which would mean that it's kind of like, you know, that, like the very top is like bent backwards. So as the speeds change, right, as you get a beat frequency, it's kind of like you're, you're doing this to that eddy current, right? Okay. It just so happens that the, the skin depth from the one megahertz there, that skin depth is right about the same as that, that spot, that node, that's, transition into the other direction. Hmm. Let me ask you this. You ever thought about it when it spikes you automatically you said equal and opposite. So what is it the lack of energy? Would that allow air molecules to get in there and give it a lift? So you're getting a heavy field, then you automatically get the equal field that's opposite of that where it has the lack of something. So you, if you're in an airplane, it'd be a stall. You know what I mean? Where your propeller stalls out on you. And then everything around you comes into it. So could it be just that? I, I know I'm trying to pin it down, but I'm based on what you're doing, I'm trying to figure out if it if it could be the opposite or the or is it the interaction between the two? So are you are you saying uh air pressure differences as being the lift mechanism? Is that what you're getting at or? It, it, it could be. I mean, it, it, if you take all the field, right? And then at one point the field drops dra drastically, right? Or it spikes and then it goes boom, pushes out and then boom, drastically falls in, right? Then is the air pressure difference changing where it is? You know what I mean? Because air has weight based on where it is in the sky. So why wouldn't it? So that video that I just shared earlier, um, that outdoor vid, the wind is blowing really hard, right? And so the whole thing like tilts into the wind, right? There's probably some important things to be taken away from that, right? If it blew like away from it and it was just being held on by the wires on the ground, like that would make a lot more sense. But the fact that it points itself into the wind because you could charge the air particles around you. You know what I mean? If there's a heavy enough charge, and that's what I mean by pushing it out, you're, you're creating charges on those particles. If they suck in, it pulls it towards it. Does that make sense? It creates a little vacuum. So uh, Todd Desiato, one of the physicists in, in our group, he uh, was saying recently how uh, the fact that on the bottom there, um, you get that negative charge that like slowly builds up over time. His thinking right now is, well, maybe you're creating like a magnetic confinement for all these charged ions of air, right? And maybe when you pulse the ultrasound, like you break that confinement and it lets that charged ions like pulse upward or something like that. But this concept that you, you get much different pressures of air when it's ionized than when it's not, that might be something. Um, Charles recently found a video by a guy who does some gravel flyer videos. He's called Kedium Physics. You might have seen yeah. stuff. Yep. So he came out like two weeks ago and he's like, look at this thing that I built. And it's like a little tube with a coil around it made out of cardboard. And he's got a cardboard on top and it's got a bunch of holes poked in it. And he put stuff over it and he's like, look, I replicated it. Uh, whenever I turn on the ultrasound, I can make these things fly off the top. Well, the Which means, part. yeah, it means you put two fields right there. They okay, both look to the same source, which is the same as a gravity flyer. And then the center one, he pulses it. 
the thinking right now is that what's actually happening is when he turns on the ultrasound, it's, you know, that transducer is like, you know, punching air through those holes. But <clears throat> in order to account for like the weight of the little glue stick or whatever he sits on top, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that it's because the air inside there is getting charged up, that that might explain why it's got enough oomph to be able to push these things off. Well, Lexi does the same experiment. I've seen him out. He was outside and he did the same exact experiment. I watched it this morning. With ultrasound? I'm not remembering that video. He does a box about yay big. And he goes outside it's about this deep. He has holes in the top of it. And then he places things on top of it and it jumps right off. He's pulling off the same thing. So if he's doing that same type of research that this guy was doing, right? We should probably take a correlation to his gravity flyer because that's the same thing he's doing, right? Mm -hmm. So it may, you know what I mean, cross the fields of what he's doing there. Uh, it may be worth looking at, you know what I mean? I'm going to have to find because that video. Alex, he was sharing it from someone else that was studying Grabenikov, but we're not sure that, uh, you know, how accurate or truthful that other video is that he clipped. So it might be a hoax, but the one from Cadium might be just sound or of the charged particles uh, moving the air. But it might be something more because some people speculate it's creating like solenoids like the toroidal um sound bubbles that are coming out the holes that are charged and that kind of has like a minor evo kind of effect where there's more to that it's creating the, the thrust the movement maybe little vortexes of air right it's spinning the air mm -hmm. inside with the spinning magnetic field and it's charged so it's a charged vortex of air that's getting punched up through the holes that's how it's got the extra angular momentum to be able to have that air have extra punch. It's something to look into, at least, you know what I mean? If yeah. you don't have an answer for it, go in everything until you get it right. Yeah, it seems easier to get. And we know by doing the test with just the speaker on without the high voltage and the, the DC from the magnetic coil inductor. I know this video has been really long, but there was so much good information there that I wanted to share it all at once. So at least you have it, you can watch it at your leisure. And uh, hopefully it was informative for you and gave you a lot of insight into what we're actually looking at. Anyway, thank you very much, have a great day. And if you like it, subscribe to all that fun stuff. Uh, but thank you for watching.